So now we're at a point in the morning where we've kind of heard about a, a few a few different uh, solutions that you can implement with your business, and it's all great because it's definitely going to help you grow your business and kind of take it to the next level. At the end, at the end of the day, though, it's still that tangible customer that's going to be visiting and hopefully revisiting your store and or website. The next session is going to show you where you need to focus today so you can be ready for that customer of tomorrow. Milos Franasevich is the VP and Head of Marketing uh, for MasterCard in Canada. At MasterCard, Milos is responsible for leading a diverse team in all aspects of marketing within the country, overseeing brand evolution, consumer research and insights, advertising, digital, social, sponsorships, and partner marketing with banks and merchants. Milos continues to play a critical role in ensuring strategic alignment and support for MasterCard's products and solutions priorities, while staying ahead of the industry trends and challenges. He is also a member of Worldwide Marketing Leadership Team, regularly contributing and leading strategic thinking across a variety of global marketing topics. Please welcome Milos. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I was just listening, obviously, to the last presentation and the, the panel discussion, which was um, really interesting. I think anybody that's um, you know, certainly been reading about technology and the evolution has seen just how rapidly it's evolving um, year over year. Um, it's amazing the difference that we've seen even in the last 10 years um, with, with the change in that pace. So a big part of today uh, of what I'm going to share with you is just some research that we've done. Um, that, that video that you've just seen um, is a summary of a, of a critical piece of research that we did a couple years ago. And really the question that we were asking ourselves was, um, what is the consumer experience going to look like by 2020? And what is the merchant experience going to look like by 2020? Um, it's important for us as a business to have a point of view on that, um, you know, on that sort of topic and also to share it with our customers, big and small. Um, so that was a big part of why we commissioned this, um, the, the research that you see. So it was really about painting the picture. It's not going to be, um, what you're going to see today is, I think, important insights that can help businesses of all size think about their future and, and how to grow successfully and maintain success. But it's certainly no silver bullet. Um, we're not professing to have all the answers in this uh, space, but it's really a point of view that I think that we're um, looking to share with everybody today. Um, so as the, as the video suggested, there are um, a number of you know, macro drivers that we see happening in the marketplace. The research that we did, um, it was very important for us to make sure that we had a Canadian point of view. So everything that you're about to see is, uh, is based on the Canadian landscape. We did speak with industry experts across North America, um, but ones that had a point of view within Canada. And then we certainly um, did cover um, consumers in Canada from coast to, uh, coast to coast as well to, um, to help us develop this perspective. Um, this framework that we've developed, uh, we did it in 2015, and it is a, it's a framework now that's been leveraged by our company in a number of markets around the world. It's also helped us develop a 2025 point of view, which is an even bigger, obviously, macro point of view for our company globally. Um, so a big part for us today is, uh, as the video mentioned, there, there's a number of drivers of change that are taking place in the market. And when we underwent this research, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're all human beings, we're all consumers. There's a lot of things that we are seeing and experiencing out in the market. Um, so there was an element of this for me personally that I wasn't expecting to be surprised by. Um, and as I look at some of the drivers of change that we've, um, you know, that we've uncovered in the market, there's probably, you know, roughly 80% of them. Um, things that, you know, that we've been aware of, maybe they've been framed a little bit differently um, with respect to the drivers that you're seeing on the, uh, on the screen here. But um, the really cool part for us, I think, was the 20% that were new things that we hadn't quite thought about or that we hadn't thought about to this extent um, and extreme. So just in the interest of time, I'm not going to walk through every single one of these drivers of change. I'm going to hit on about two or three just to give you a little bit more perspective on what's behind these. Um, this is a research study that, um, that we have made available and will continue to make available to our partners. Um, we've had a long-standing partnership with the Business Improvement Associations across Toronto dating back well over six to seven years now. Um, and this is a research that we think is valuable for all businesses, whether you're a large business or a small business. Um, so a couple of the ones that I'll hit on today that are, you know, that are of personal interest to me that I've found interesting. Um, the first one that I'll, I'll use as an example is the um, shifting trust. And I think anybody that's been paying attention to the news um, the last 12 months can certainly get a handle on 
um, you know, what I'm referring to there. But as we got into this research, a big part of it, the part that wasn't surprising was the opinion that consumers can have about corporations and businesses that they engage with. Um, I think building trust and maintaining trust has always been a, a, a critical underpinning of any successful business, regardless of size. The part that um, we found that was very interesting in this evolution of sh uh, shifting trust is it now includes media. And as you think about what's happened in, you know, uh, with you know, the political landscape the last 12 months across North America, I think there, there's certainly things that help point and, and validate that, that question or that concern that consumers have. As a, as a marketer and as a consumer, I really boil this down to people are looking for credible sources of information. And those credible sources of information are increasingly coming from non-traditional forms. Um, there was some discussion about consumer reviews. There, there's plenty of data out there that suggests the importance um, and the critical value that consumer reviews play. Um, and I think that people increasingly trust their colleagues, their friends, their family for that type of information. Um, but they're also searching out different types of uh, sources for, um, you know, for this type of information. And I think for all of us, uh, of regardless of business size, it's really important to take that trust seriously and that trust can manifest itself into your privacy policies um, as an e-commerce business. It can also manifest itself into um, how you align your business and your brand in terms of the values that you represent. Um, another one for us that certainly relates to the payment space, um, which I'm a part of, but, but goes well beyond that is the, the shifting loyalty paradigm. Again, there's been an, uh, you know, a lot of coverage in the last um, six to 12 months, I would say, about what's happening in the loyalty space across Canada and globally. And there, there's two points that I think are worthwhile to drive home here is, one is that um, consumers are no longer loyal to brands the way they used to be. And it's really important that people understand that and, and take that to heart. Um, and it covers a wide variety of, of industries and categories, including luxury. I think if you were to look back 15, 20 years ago, there was a real dedication in terms of the uh, affinity that consumers felt towards lux uh, luxury brands. And it's just not the same um, as, it, as it used to be. So there's, there's a lot of, um, I think, evolving um, discussion in that space of how to stay relevant as a brand. Um, just based on digital and social media and what we have access to today and how, how your reputation can change overnight. The other one that's really, um, I, I think, valuable because it especially, I think, democratizes certain things for small businesses is that the influence of the experience is becoming just as important as the offer or the reward that people receive. And when you think about, you know, when you think about that, that's really, it's a big part of why people pass along knowledge to others. It's a really good, um, uh, experience and I've certainly you know I've had a few of those in the last couple of weeks myself with respect to looking for um, you know credible contractors to help us with our house and, and utilizing websites such as Homestars that you know we didn't have access to 10 plus years ago now um, so there's a lot that's happening in that space um, the other couple that I'll touch on um, which I just think are interesting one is the mainstreaming of robotics within the next uh, three to five years now if you would have told me that would have been the case 10 years ago, I would have thought you were, you were crazy. But when I look at what's happening and the pace of innovation happening in this space and the organizations um, globally that are innovating in this space, um, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's much more rapid than it's ever been. Um, and again, if you take a step back and you think about what that driver of change means, it means that people are thinking of increasing ways to be more economical, but also meet the demands and interests of their consumers. Um, the last one that I'll touch on is the, the rise of small businesses across Canada, um, which is uh, obviously a big reason why we're, why we're all here today. Um, they are, um, the, the growth that we're seeing in small businesses is, is really um, certainly beyond double digit um, with businesses that are operating and starting up um, today. And I think, when I think back on my own family, um, you know, I grew up in Hamilton. Uh, I've called Toronto home now for over 20 years. My mother was a hairdresser who started her own business 30 years ago. And when I think about the ways that she was trying to reach new customers, it's vastly different than 
the, the opportunities that, that small business owners have today. Um, I would argue that it's never been, um, there's never been fewer barriers to entry than there are now to start a small business. That is not to suggest that it's easy, and that's not to suggest that it's easy to be profitable. Um, but I think that there are, uh, that it's a greater opportunity to, greater opportunity to be an entrepreneur today than, uh, than there ever has been in the past. So I think that's a, it's a great opportunity for a number of businesses. The other piece of that that I think is important is 20 or 30 years ago, you had to develop a lot of these skill sets yourself. You've got a lot of providers out there now that can help with the services you need, whether it's uh, providers such as Shopify and providing mobile um, and digital platforms that can reach consumers um, in, in all the different ways that they want, as well as you know product um, offerings, how you manage inventory. Uh, it's a very, very different um, way of doing business and it allows you, I think, to be more nimble and start off in a bit, um, bit more of a conservative place than you necessarily needed to 20 years ago. Um, so I think that's another um, important development as well. There's a number of other drivers of change here. Again, I'm happy to make this presentation available and, and, um, and make time for anybody that would like to dig in a little bit deeper. Um, the, the version of this that I can share will have a bit more of a description around um, each of the drivers of change. So even for a business such as ours, you know, there's only so much that you can action. 24 drivers are a lot um, to try and make sense of. So as we went to the next stage of our thinking, we wanted, to, um, we wanted to examine as you fit these drivers of change together, how do they, how do they form strategic departure points or, or directions that you can point your business in? Um, it gets back to that one point of if there's one thing that you want to be known for by 2020, what is that one thing? Obviously, every business doesn't have the luxury of focusing on one thing, but I would argue it takes um, one or two things to really um, excel at to be able to propel your business forward. So we were looking at how these things combine, and what we've come down to is um, 10 strategic departure points, five for consumers um, and five for um, five for small businesses and, and merchants as well. So there's a connection point between these. Um, you know, again, this is our point of view. I think as, as a small business owner, you're gonna have a different point of view as you go into this. But uh, I'm gonna touch on each one of these a little uh, in a little bit greater detail. Um, and then again, as I make this available, obviously I'm happy to um, you know, ev um, evolve the discussion and give uh, a little bit more context. So the first one is from mass to me on the consumer side and from the merchant side, from targets to relationships. This is really a statement of the power of algorithmic based modeling that's available to small businesses um, now. It's really, really evolving from what we used to call in marketing, personalized marketing to predictive modeling. Um, you're able to take inputs from a variety of different places. You need to ensure that you obviously have the proper consent uh, and that you're adhering to, uh, to the uh, privacy policies that are laid out by Castle as well as your own organization. Um, but you've got the ability, I think, to anticipate needs in a new way that consumers, that we never really had the opportunity to do before. And when you think about it from a merchant point of view, it's going from targets to relationships. Um, you've got to do it in a responsible fashion, but I believe that there's, there's a great opportunity there. The next one that's, that's really, you know, uh, personal interest to me is this idea of going from tech-led to human-led and from the transaction to the brand experience. Um, the, the point of this is not to suggest that we're going backwards and that it's going to go back to being human-led, but I, I believe very, very strongly that there is a need for balance. And when you think about the end-to-end -end consumer experience, um, being human-led manifests itself in a couple ways. It can affect your product design. Um, it can affect your user experience of how you want consumers to engage with your brand. Um, it can affect the points at which you offer human consumer uh, customer experience versus what you can do through social and online. And I think for small businesses, that's always been a critical point of differentiation, that personal value that you can, um, that you can add in that space. And it allows you to take your business from transaction to brand experience as well as a merchant. A couple of the other ones are from individual to collaborative and from goods to solutions. One small example of going from individual to collaborative is the power of reviews. 92% of consumers read online reviews. 40% form an opinion from just one to three reviews. I recently read an article that, um, that even went so far as to say that one consumer review can have an impact of up to 66% 60 in terms of purchase intent from a consumer. So that gets back to this idea of trust. 
who do you trust? You trust other consumers. And I think as, as you're going through this, you're seeing a lot of organizations put even greater value and weight in, in ensuring that they're getting that feedback from consumers, that they're sharing it with, um, with other potential customers as well. From routine to discovery and from channel um, to integration is really a statement, I think the panel had, had hit on it quite well, of there's no linear behavior to um, being a consumer anymore. Um, I was um, at, a, at an event last week and there was one uh, business that's in the um, hospitality and, and travel business and pretty significant brand and they said that the average consumer consults over 100 websites before they will make a purchase on their website. And sometimes that purchase is calling in. They want to talk to a person, they want verification that their interpretation is correct. So. Um, gone are the days where people walk into the store, just uh, engage in an e-commerce transaction, having a mobile uh, responsive design site, um, having a, a, a better understanding of what your consumers want and how they engage with you is critically important. And the last one that I'll touch on here very quickly is from, um, the, from the consumer side, going from what we call value add to value matrix, and from the merchant side, going from privacy policy to privacy philosophy. Um, a consumer's decision set is more complicated now than it's ever been. I'm seeing business models um, locally as well as beyond uh, Toronto that are taking new things to, into account because it matters to a consumer. Um, I've seen businesses now, small businesses that have started in cities across North America where they will publish the, um, everything that leads into their retail price. For their, um, for their product. They will identify what their cost of labor is, their cost of materials. They'll be transparent about what their markup is. And that is reflective of people wanting to know um, where your goods and services are coming from and what your value is in the chain. Um, that demand was never there when you look at it um, 20 years ago. And I think that those are niche opportunities for you as a retailer, big or small, to be able to differentiate your business. Um, and when you look at from privacy policy to philosophy, it really gets down to um, having a consumer voice that people can relate to. Um, I think you know everybody obviously has um, interests that they need to protect, for lack of a better word. But I think when you think about the language that you use in your marketing materials or in, in your, your engagement with consumers, but also the, the way that you want to engage with businesses, having a philosophy is actually more important than having a policy. Um, and I encourage everybody to think along those lines. It really gets back to that idea of being human-led versus um, technology-led in that respect. So, you know, as we thought about, I wanted to share with everybody how we get to some of these drivers of change. So as you look at from tech-led to human-led, um, you know, we were looking at that matrix of drivers of change in the 24, and which ones actually help make up this driver of change. And for us as a business, as we get into product development or we try to help our customers of all sizes. My advice to you is, as you look through this, you're, these things on the left side are like levers. You have the opportunity to think of which one of these levers do I actually have an advantage, of, uh, advantage with today and where can I excel? Or where do I actually think I can gain an advantage with one of these levers that I may not have today? So it's not about pulling all six. Um, it's about the one or two that you think is gonna help you differentiate locally from your, your base um, or, or more broadly as an e-com merchant um, nationally or, or beyond borders, how you want to differentiate yourself. And for a lot of our customers, it's obviously important to know that, you know, this information is grounded in, um, in research and findings. And, and for us, as, as we look at this, a lot of what we can share is some background information, understand how we came to these. So as you look at the rise of algorithmic-based um, directed lives, 40% of Canadian consumers consider themselves to be early adopters of technology. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that every business feels that way because it is a risk. It feels like a risk for a business to want to invest in certain things. But I think that's why you have to make sure that you've got good partners like, um, um, like the Googles of the world, the Shopify's, um, Yellow Pages, MasterCard that can help you in, the, in, in that respect. Um, and a couple of other points as well, as you think about the growth of the experience economy, um, you know, experience really means so many different things that, um, that people can get down to. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the L'Oreal app where um, consumers are able to try on lipstick without actually going into a store. Um, it's one of the most successful applications when you look at it in the retail space. And there's no reason why that approach needs to just be for a large business. It can certainly be for a small business. There's an increasing demand for consumers to want to um, 
decrease the time that it takes to try close on. So there's a lot of innovative space, um, a lot of innovation happening in the space of uh, mirror technology and how you can evolve that experience for people. Um, we looked at it as well from the other side for merchants. When you look at um, transactions to brand experience um, as one example, how you look at the drivers of change and, and how they relate specifically um, you know, to, this, to this piece for merchants. When you look at the rising importance of big data, um, and, and again, there's service providers out there that can help with, um, with this. We actually have a product called Local Market Intelligence, which will help small businesses just understand what's happening in their, um, in their neighborhood with respect to spend, different categories. It's all anonymized, so there is nothing um, uh, obviously that goes beyond the requirements of privacy, but it gives you a better idea of, of what's happening in your neighborhood. Um, and, you know, the part that I think is is fascinating here is, you know, there's a statistic that we've seen of, it's a 38% increase um, in Canadian data scientist salaries since 2009. Um, there's a huge, huge demand in this space now. Um, there was actually a quote from uh, anybody that knows Mark Cuban, he's an owner of the Dallas Mavericks basketball team, but um, very, very successful technology entrepreneur over the last 20 years. Um, he made a statement at last year's, all, um, this past All-Star game, that he believes that the skill set of the next 10 years is going to be about creativity and critical thinking. Um, it's not necessarily going to be about programming and, and data platforms. A lot of that is going to be provided, but it's about what you do with the data, how you look at it from different angles, and that's an inherently um, human value. Um, so I won't talk too much more about this. This is a demonstration of how we start to get the hypothesis on our end of how do we want to try and put this into action? What do we think it's going to mean for our business? So this is our lens. Um, again, businesses um, that leverage this type of data or other data will go through this practice of their own. I think it's really important to know what kind of a business you want to be and um, what sort of values you want to represent and how you're going to differentiate yourself from your competition. Um, I'm going to get into just a couple of examples because for me it always, um, it always helps to, to, put, um, to put things like this into perspective. So as you think about the idea of going from tech-led to human-led, uh, somebody on the panel earlier had mentioned Square. I, I think it's probably one of the neatest innovations of the last 10 years. It's democratized a lot in terms of small businesses and your accessibility to be able to access um, electronic payments and, and commerce in general. Um, that is a... I think that there was a real human element when you look at that design. Obviously, it's technology-based, but it's the idea of, of meeting consumer interests when they happen and where they arise, um, which I think is very important. Um, and as well, it's a demonstration of going from transaction to brand experience. Um, and when they launched, I remember the amount of buzz that was in the market locally as well as beyond the borders of what this business, what this business had done for other businesses. Um, the other example that I'll use, anybody that's been to Disney um, you know, recently, knows about their magic band and the magic band is really a um, you know nfc band that's on your wrist it dubs as your um, it dubs as your room key it dubs as your access into rides it dubs as your payment mechanism for merchandise food beverages whatever happens on site so you don't need to carry a wallet around anymore you don't need to carry a purse around anymore and when you think about the idea of human led that's really what the impetus was for it. They wanted to move, they wanted to give people the opportunity to explore more of the park. Part of this was cutting down on lines and helping people um, enjoy more of the park experience, but also certainly a part of it was helping facilitate commerce um, in that respect. Another one that, um, that I think is of interest, and again, it's an example um, of different sizes, but um, the pilot store that Amazon has launched in Seattle. Uh, their Amazon Go, which is a grocery chain. It's the first one that is checkout free. So you tap in with your device, and whether it's a card or, or mobile device, and you pick up your items and you tap on the way out and your transactions are taken care of. Whether that's going to be the technology that stands the test of time in five years, nobody really knows, but it's really more of a statement towards innovation. Um, I think anybody that stood in a long line, um, probably you know, whether it's e-com or, or in-store is abandoned uh, as we call it, abandon the cart, and this is really a, a movement to try and help alleviate, um, you know, some of that, uh, some of that, and help facilitate and help commerce grow. Uh, one example for us was Clothespin and how we, you know, how we innovate with uh, a brand such as Maytag um, that hadn't really had a substantial innovation in, I would argue, 20 maybe 30 years, and something that plays its way into laundry mats. So this whole idea was about an application that can help you schedule. 
um, your laundry machine, an app, uh, application that can help you take care of payment without needing coins uh, and all that sort of stuff um, to be able to, to make it work. And, you know, this is the sort of innovation that I think you're seeing in market. There's tons of providers out there that you can leverage um, to be able to use this. And the really good ones know how to speak layman. Um, it's not about being a tech head. It's very much about your job as, as a business owner, first and foremost, is to be successful. It's not to be a technology expert. Um, so there's, you're seeing more and more innovation in this space that I, that I think matters. So the big so what for us out of all of this was, um, you know, as you think about this and as I've encouraged our company and our own product development and as we speak to business improvement associations or larger scale merchants, it's really to ask yourself, um, by 2020, what one thing do you want to be known for? Um, where are you going to stake your leadership claim? And there's a lot of, I think, very, very successful uh, small businesses that we've seen in Toronto. Um, you know, my family and I live in the West End and um, we're very much local shoppers um, in that respect. And there, there's a lot that I've seen that, that really excites me in terms of how I think small businesses are able to com compete um, with larger scale businesses. Um, so for me, it, this isn't about a, a question of large versus small. It's, it's a question of, uh, as a business owner, what kind of uh, leadership stake do you want to, um, what uh, do you want to make and what existing advantage can be built on and accelerated from. This isn't about creating net new. I think any business that's doing well already today knows where they have an opportunity and where they have an advantage. The question is, have you optimized that? Have you taken, um, have you taken full advantage of that opportunity? Um, so for us today, that's really um, what I wanted to share. Um, there is a full report, obviously, uh, as I've mentioned. I'm happy to make that available. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about the insight and research that we're going into. Um, the next study that we're embarking on as an organization is the future of loyalty and what that means. And loyalty is far beyond points, far beyond offers. It's about the way that consumers engage with brands and what their expectation is of brands. A lot of great examples out there of brands that don't discount, that don't offer rewards points, but have immense loyalty with their consumer base, both locally as well as abroad. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much.